here with this type of compounds um, are described as materials combine, combining transition metals in, metals in general, but in my case in particular, I'll be focusing on transition metals. So um, with boron, typically we can have like uh, metal rich borite that will be those that have comp compositions where you have high amount of metals, or we can have also boron rich um, uh, materials like this one, where we have excess boron. You can see here that we can have up to six, six boron atoms for just one metal atom. So um, this slide here also shows the type of properties that we are, in, in my group, typically interested in, especially for this talk, I'll be focusing on catalysis. <clears throat> so, um, after this brief, brief introduction about borate and especially hydrogen, um, I'll be talking about some electrocatalysts that we've developed, starting with binary, uh, borate, then borate solute solution, and at the end, I'll be introducing some nanomaterials that uh, we've studied. Um, now, uh, before working in electrocatalysis, like, like I mentioned, we started three and a half years ago. Uh, my group was mainly focusing on uh, magnetic materials. And in this slide here, we made um, basically an account of all those work and for those who are interested, those very exciting results. Um, I, I highly recommend this publication that uh, we published Oh, it's now already three years ago. I'm sorry. So, now, why are we interested in hydrogen? First, let's give some advantages of uh, hydrogen as energy source. Right? So, as you can see here, um, so we talked about all the possibilities of using hydrogen. And I will not go into the details of all this. But basically, um, it's an environmentally... Um, let's say it's an energy source that is renewable and environmentally friendly. So compare this to um, fossil fuel, fuel, for example, um, where we can produce CO2. Here, we basically have carbon-free, clean, renewable energy. Right? Um, but one main challenge that we see for hydrogen here is basically how do we efficiently produce hydrogen. Right now, hydrogen is being produced by, uh, through the fossil fuel industry, meaning that we still have some high carbon uh, footprint there. So it would be good to be able to produce hydrogen using water. Right? Um, and Another challenge is here is even now the hydrogen produce, uh, the catalyst that use is platinum. And platinum is not abundant, it is expensive, so it would be very good to kind of uh, substitute uh, platinum. So this figure here actually shows that, that the, the, the abundance of some element that we are interested in. And basically, this is the range we want to get at some point. So right now, research is moving toward this direction. Right, from platinum moving upward, it will be great if we can find some materials um, that will be as good as platinum, uh, but far less, less expensive. Um, so in terms of just the element, all these elements are basically not active at all. I'll show you a slide in a moment um, showing you that. So this slide here is basically called volcano plots where we plot the current density as function of uh, the free energy of hydrogen adsorption and desorption. So basically, yeah, as you can see here, uh, the less expensive element, um, basically on this side, most of them, so um, are very far away from this position where we call basically the 
free energy should be zero for that process of adsorption and desorption. Um, and now the, the element that uh, have free energy that are close to zero are over here, and they also should be having high current density, as you can see here. So, um, but you can imagine what all these elements have in common, all of them. Um, they are very expensive. So I usually joke like nature is not so kind with us. When something is very great, then it's either very abundant or, or very expensive. So it's up to us now to come up with some um, new compounds that will basically um, replace these highly expensive materials. Um, so I'll be showing you some um, BFT free energy calculations and if you are interested to know the details of how, how those calculations are done, uh, I can come back and explain to you here. Um, so, now, why are we interested in borite? Um, in 2012, uh, this publication by the uh, WHO group uh, was made uh, in Angevante Chimie, and basically, from what you can take out of this publication is basically just this work, the bulk. Now, people familiar with catalysis in general is that some of the main requirements you have uh, for good, very good catalysis is you need high surface area, you need uh, typically very small particle size because that will help increase the number of active sites. Now, that typically means that nanomaterials are the materials that you want to study. Yet, these boride and carbide were already very competitive as bulk. That's about three order of magnitude larger particles that show similar activity as nanomaterials. And this caught my, my, my attention at, at the time when I was still in Germany because I was working on this field but using boride as magnet instead. Um, I said, okay, uh, because we are working basically on bulk material, um, how about learning more about the structure activity relationship? If these materials are already active in the bulk, then um, studying the, the structure activity relationship will be possible. That's something you cannot do with nanomaterials so easily because with nanomaterials, you have to take care of the type of shape that you have. Um, you, you have to take care of uh, the surface area. For the bulk material, the surface area is practically, practically uh, compared to nanomaterials, very, very small, right? And the particle size, as, 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 as I mentioned here, they are all micron size particles, so very large. So if anything, then this material, if they are active, then things like the surface um, of the bulk will play a large role and not, not like edges or things like this. So we started a study with um, molybdenum based material, like at the time we were starting this, uh, most material studies were molybdenum based like most material beside platinum. So the reason we can go, uh, uh, we, can, we can discuss the reason later on, but that's why we started with molybdenum based material. Again, our aim was to understand, can we find a relationship between crystal structure and activity? So, which is why we started studying uh, different composition and different crystal structure in this system. Now, as you can see here, uh, as we move from top to the bottom, the amount of molybdenum is decreasing. Right? We basically have three cases. This one is molybdenum rich. These two have the same amount of molybdenum and boron. And this one is boron rich. Right? So as you can see here, the main difference as we go move from top to bottom is that here on the top, the Boron atoms are not connected with each other. You can see the green, they are very far away from each other. Um, 
And as we increase the amount of boron, they start making connection. In these two cases, the connection is exactly the same. We build here so-called zigzag chains, right? Uh, the only difference between these two is that I have two types of chains, uh, not two types, but two orientation of chain, uh, one in this direction and the other going out of the board. This one is just going out of the board, right? Out of my slide. Uh, when we come to this case, then we have a uh, planar arrangement of those uh, boron atoms. So what we call also graphene-like arrangement. So similar to structure of graphene. So um, now let's talk about the electrochemical properties of these materials. Starting with the elements that are involved, boron, um, it's also uh, is far less active than molybdenum here. Here, this curve shows you the current density as function of, of potential. Um, the ideal material will have a potential that's so -called, um, of zero, meaning having zero over potential. So this range here is over potential. That means the excess potential that we don't need. Uh, you see that platinum, Basically, it's very close to that value. Now, um, molybdenum has the highest overpotential uh, in terms of um, the other materials, but boron uh, is, in this case, far, far less active. Than molybdenum. Now, uh, you, these two, we, we, can, we can understand it just because we are talking about electrocatalysis, meaning that the conduction the electrical conductivity is playing a great role. So uh, this being a metal and this being a semi-metal, so this is understandable. Now, what happens now when we combine these two? When we combine these two, the trend, basic, the trend basically is reverse. Now, molybdenum was most active. Now, molybdenum-rich compound here is the least active. Why the molybdenum poor compound here is the more active. So just by saying that molybdenum is the element that was used at the time and people are work, working a lot on molybdenum, um, it was referring to as molybdenum is probably the active site. Obviously, this, is, this will be not the case in this material because if molybdenum is considered as active site, then molybdenum-rich compound will be uh, the most active. So, and this is not the case. So there is some other aspect to these materials that we need to understand. And that probably has to do with boron because we just have boron as the other element. So um, now, this work was, was published and we actually tease people here in saying that we have a boron dependency, and not molybdenum, what people were, think, were they thinking at the time. Um, and I'll show you later on uh, why it is so important to say, to talk about boron dependency. Let me check the time here. Okay. Uh, still have like a few minutes. So um, I'll show you one more example with this uh, material, just to mention here that molybdenum really is not uh, the most important element here. If you change molybdenum by vanadium, basically you can still see that this compound here will be the most active one, right? So VB2, is the most active instead of being in VB. Um, now, we wanted to understand what role exactly boron is playing here. So we did some DFT free energy calculation for the most active uh, material, MOB2. Um, this is the boron layer. This is the molybdenum layer on, in, in this material. So we basically study different um, active sites, like in a hollow site, in a bridge site on top of the boron atom, and do the same here for the molybdenum atom. We studied also uh, different mixed surfaces where we have 
molybdenum and boron mixed on a terminal that surface. On top of that, we studied the effect of um, hydrogen uh, percentage. Like if you have less hydrogen on the surface, and as we increase the percentage of hydrogen, um, how will the material behave or how the absorption, distortion behave? So the free energy in, in general. In this case. So the result is basically summarized in this plot. Now the black curve here is the um, benchmark, that's the platinum. Everyone want to hit, be like platinum, right? So we are basically comparing all those surfaces with platinum. And this is the deep free energy as function of hydrogen percentage. As you can see here, as we increase the hydrogen percentage for platinum, um, at close to 80% here, we see that this curve reaches free energy of zero, which is what you want. So this is the optimal um, hydrogen production uh, uh, place for the platinum. Now let's look at what the bor boron based surface is doing. The green here gives you the, exactly the boron surface, that graphene-like boron surface. And you can see here the behavior is nearly perfectly mimicking platinum. Even better is crossing this zero free energy line at even higher, right, at even higher percentage. This is typically interpreted as this material can be uh, very active at high current density because that's where we have a lot of hydrogen uh, being involved on the surface. So, and I'll show you later on uh, some of uh, what, what I mean, if I get the time to do so. We have about a few minutes here. So, um, just to mention that uh, during the same time, Ion B2 was also published, right? And they basically obtained similar results to us that like the boron layer is basically the most active layer uh, in this material, and not molybdenum. Now, I'll skip this part here, um, which basically is showing us that all those type of MB2 materials, right? We can find a relationship between the C over A ratio of the crystal structure with the activity of this type of material, right? Um, and because that C over A ratio matched so well on this binary, the question we asked was, um, how about using this C over A ratio uh, basically to uh, design better catalysts? For example, if I'm looking at this area where the materials are the most active, right? Um, is it possible to make a combination of this and this, for example? And what would be the consequence of making that, that, uh, that combination? So I'll just jump to that part so that I can show you exactly what I mean, uh, because that's the most recent result. So that combination is here, and we wanted to test the C of A ratio. So that's the latest parameter of the A axis. Uh, for solid solution, typically, uh, with the so-called Vega rule, uh, is fulfilled, you have a full solid solution, basically meaning that latest parameter changes with size of one of the atoms linearly. And you can see a similar trend here. But what happened for the C axis is that it doesn't follow that rule at all. It's half like we call, I call it here canonic, like canonic like shape. Goes up and then drop abruptly. We are kind of curious, and this basically shows um, the C axis is the axis where we have the layer in the crystal structure. Okay? Uh, it's basically just that's the C axis. We have the layer here, meaning that those layer basically uh, the, the distance between them increase, increase, and at some point decrease again. Right? And when we measure the activity, the hydrogen production activity uh, in terms of over potential here, uh, that's the blue curve. So the red here, that's the C latest parameter, and the blue here, that's the over potential that I'll show you. It gives you the exact same behavior as the C latest parameter. Right. So um, 
And as I was mentioning, for this type of material, they are very active at high current density. This one, the most active one, basically the top here, um, actually become much better than platinum. That's the nanomaterial platinum uh, at high current density. Right. So these materials show a lot of potential right now, and we are hopeful that um, moving towards nanomaterial, we can obtain even greater properties. So three years ago, we published a new method of how to synthesize this material, at least the binary materials in, at, 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 at the nanoscale. And we recently showed that we can actually make what nanomaterial is so good about, basically showing that if you have different um, type of nanomaterial, here you have some kind of microspheres, while here you have uh, some kind of needle-like shape, then the activity of these two is very different. Uh, you can see here, this will be for the microsphere, and this here will be for those uh, nanorod-like shape. So there's still a lot to do in, in this area, and we, we hope that we can excite the, uh, basically, um, the electrocatalysis community with the idea that structure activity relationship